We're sitting here with Christian Pronovo, veteran in the Montreal music scene. Can you tell us about what you've witnessed throughout the years in the evolution of the scene? Well, <clears throat> scene didn't really exist before, you know, I mean, the system didn't exist. That's the biggest difference. Is now there is a, a real star system and, and music business, electronic music system that didn't exist before. I guess uh, when I started, it was more, uh, there was a club, and, you know, there was a, something in a corner, there was a hole in the wall, and there was a guy playing music there. I think that's what uh, that's what attracted me, like originally, you know. When I experienced it the first time, I don't really remember where and how, you know. But I I do remember, like, you know, being attracted by the music. And once I understood at, at a very young age that, you know, there was somebody like playing the music, uh, <clears throat> I was like drawn to it instantly. Like I can remember very very far like you know having like a little setup a little DJ booth but like that's when DJ didn't exist really <laughs> I mean yeah. like we're listening I mean radio had a big effect all that that stuff was the original thing you know there was less club so obviously more influential club uh, I mean no no uh, no internet so no social media no sharing music I mean, to hear music, you had to go in clubs, so yeah. it's very, very different. And uh, there was not so many clubs, and club uh, radio and, and video and social media didn't dictate what was playing by cl in clubs. There was, and there wasn't so much music output all the time. Nowadays, there's like you cannot be on top of music, and I'm, I'm someone that likes to be on top of music, and I, I must admit that I, I don't have the pretension that I say I'm on top of music. I'm on top of the music I like but I'm not on top of all the music, electronic music that gets released today. It's, it's too, it's ridiculous what gets released today. So that's the biggest difference. We went from very limited amount of music and, uh, and various style, you know, to like tons of music in each style and a lot of subgenres that didn't exist. Between that and that, well, you know, there's the internet, there's also the club culture that evolved, there's the social side of everything that evolved, because originally, originally, I think, uh, when they call about underground culture, it was really underground, meaning there were, there were clubs, but there was a lot of uh, uh, un illegal after hours where I was seen, especially in Montreal, that's, that's, originally there were clubs open till 6 a.m in the 70s, 80s, that was legal. After that, they all lost their license to open till six. So we went for about 10 years without uh, clubs open till six. But it's funny because when the, some of the last club lost their license, nobody talked about it. It was just, people were kind of over it. Anyway, between three and six, there was less and less people going out for whatever reason. I was, I guess that's 82, 83, 84, like slowly till the 90s. There were no clubs open after hours, legally. Then slowly but surely, you know, there was more and more parties happening. They used to call them warehouse parties. After that, there was the early days of, in the 90s, of, of, of rave in early 90s, you know. So you had the warehouse scene, you had the rave scene, all that kind of morphed together around different models of music and it gave birth to a demand and when there's demand there's someone smart enough to do business with it so yeah. somebody challenged the law and opened the first after hours in montreal which was playground in the 90s after that it was followed by sauna was followed by area stereo circus everywhere around the city at some point it was the craze to have after hours and now a lot of them closed down mm -hmm. and now there's less of them in this few of them and kind of a, a new balance to things and also the fact that like there's way more DJs now. Yeah. Before there was less. I mean, when I was younger, when I was like up and coming DJ, we had only a couple of guys to look up to, you know. And those guys were really, really actually talented, you know. And like I said, there was less music, so there was more repetition. More repetition means there were kind of hits, even if there were underground hits, there were really hits. Those are the mm -hmm. foundation of of underground dance music like either house or techno whatsoever you know it all comes from the same place and like i said because of the limitation of the output of music of releases every week well people had to be creative people had to listen to other stuff than just uh, disco record they're listening to rock album they're listening to like you know reggae that's why people from that era have a bigger culture musical culture 
in terms of roots of their culture because they have no choice but listen to a lot of choices to find because at the end of the day you need to play music you cannot play the same thing all those same uh, like 15 records all the time so you know you found that break into that rock song and that's how hip-hop like you know started too you know like people found break the beginning of a song or in the middle of the song a drum break and they start like you know scratching at first they weren't scratching they were just like flipping from one to the other to their extended because there was no dub there was no extension you know there was no instrumental really and there was everything was on 45 so people were extending 45 in the instrumental version and play with it and no mixer actually at the beginning there was like a switch 8b so you put the needle and the good guy would be the guy that could figure it out that you switch to a b and kind of be on beat you know when you're lucky you know yeah, you, yeah. if not you were skipping a beat but oh yeah. we're still in the same thing <laughs> eventually they came with the mixer and everything mm -hmm. you know like i came in the scene mixer existed and everything existed and the, the system the disco system existed you know and already the music there was already 12 inches and already the music was uh there was i came in in the scene in the late 70s so they were already like we're already post the big original disco boom so there was zillion of disco records so already there we're pretty lucky but it was still in a place where you know you had access to a lot of music and you know you're still kind of shaped to be curious between like you know the ultra like american disco sound to the european disco sound to the more electronic to the more acoustic to the more like string driven and more like kind of like soulful type of things to the more like experimental like you know a la Giorgio Moroder like you mm -hmm. know the German stuff mm -hmm. still the same thing so today it's actually just the blossom of that you know like of the branches and the trees and the leaf that comes from you know those seeds that were planted and those whatever roots that were planted you know I mean it's th it's really still really the same okay so you started this project called Lost Heroes can you tell us a bit more about it uh, Lost Heroes originally the original idea is, uh, was an output, an outlet for me to release a re edit. And I'm part of the generation that did re edits with Real to Real. And I did that in the beginning of the 80s. And I kind of stopped, but I never really stopped because I used that technique for many years because that was the only thing you could use. And when computers start happening, you know, like in some of my friends were like editing stuff in the computer like you know and, I mean in the 90s and I was like wow you can do the same thing I was doing with a tape you know and I was I was like wow like a, and my interest got back getting into reddit so I started doing reddits and the idea is uh, obviously wasn't wasn't to do I mean, the, the entire re that thing that happens today didn't exist. It was just a few guys, you know, and I knew a couple guys in New York that still doing it did. I mean, Danny Krivitz were doing it did. A couple guys in Chicago were doing it did. I mean, most of the people were already starting to do remixes. Like, you know, those are the years of, uh, of uh, the, the New York, big, the, the big New York house movement, which was like Masters at Work, Louis Vega, Todd Terry, uh, uh, Armand Van Elden, all those guys were making like killing it on remixes, you know. So for me, it was kind of like doing re edit was kind of the original form of remixing. So I started doing that, and my idea was always kind of like to introduce people to new music because uh, I had a record store for many years. So and I worked so much with new music for me that the other way it was a reaction to that was like okay let's let's do something about the lost heroes you know the people that we don't know the records that we don't know so and I have a quite vast record collection and I'm a big record collector into collecting weird record as well so like you know I had Brazilian stuff I had like uh, African stuff I had like disco stuff I had like you know uh, kind of dub Jamaican stuff and I had a bunch of things and I decided to start doing edits of them and kind of releasing them wanting to releasing them and I start releasing them so I have like about four release people that know on this guy they can look this last hero's record does exist and there's a handful of, of them I did a lot of them some of my friend did others I have guys in Europe that did re-edits and uh, that stayed after that that became uh, that became a studio project which was like uh, working with people that kind of unknown or older musician or people that people forgot or stuff like that so that was the concept and evaluate from that to 
become something that people relate to me to to now like I use it as, as a production slash artist name you know in my companies under Lost Heroes Arts and Media and everything kind of mm -hmm. gravitate around that you know and and you know I didn't really pursue the entire re the entire re-edit things funny enough now it's like such a big trend you know but yeah. I always do it like I still do it but I really do it for myself you know okay. or for friends you know there's a community of people that like still share like weird record old record but I'm not so much into like doing just old stuff or I mean it's easy for me to do re-edits and stuff like that for, for me the goal is really to bring that tradition which is the original remixing right? and that approach and because there's no point to re-edit a record that's not good I mean what's the point mm -hmm. I mean nowadays you know you got a bunch of records out a bunch of re-edits out and you don't actually know what's re-edits what's not what's original yeah. what's not I mean, I find that now between technology and everything, like, you know, what's a mashup, what's a remix, what's a re-edit. I mean, if you put new music on something that already exists, for me, it's a remix. Yeah. Some people call it a re-edit. Well, it's not. A re-edit is like you use the original track and you rearrange it. I mean, if you have access to uh, what Dimitri from Paris does, for me, his reinterpretation, he has a multi-track and he's remixing it, but like in original way, which is like, which all the uh, like original tracks, not really a re-edit. A re-edit is like when you limit yourself to, I have an instrumental, maybe I have the a cappella, maybe I have the main track, and then I'm chopping and I'm editing through an electronic program or a tape, if you're very motivated, you know, yeah, getting yeah. back to tape. Without That's, adding new sounds. Without, without adding new sounds. As soon for me, you add new sounds, it becomes kind of like, in between, you know, yeah. sometime like, you know, like I do a lot of stuff that like, I will change the drums or something like that. For me, it's not really a remix, but at the same time, it's not really like a re-edit, right? Yeah. It's in between. Mm -hmm. And nowadays it's like, what's a re-edit, what's a remix? Now, now you can buy, you know, stems, you know, and start mixing with stems. So like in the future, those no notions won't, I don't think they will exist, you know? Yeah. I mean, I dreamed about that like, you know, 20 years ago that you could have like, tracks you know and you could mix have those options of mixing like five tracks there five tracks there and have all the multi-channel you know now yeah. it's it's now it's happening it's you know there. it's there, there yeah. you know you think that's the future of DJing I, I, the I'm a guy like you know I'm a guy that drives looking forward I don't think you can drive into the future mm -hmm. uh, looking back yeah but I have a mirror and I can see where I'm from and okay. what just passed me so I think it's important to look forward and always look, you know, if you want to move forward, you have to look ahead. But it's also important to know, uh, to know where you're coming from. You know, whatever I do as a producer or as a DJ, as everything that I do actually, like I can, you know, I can go to bed at night and sleep and be like, all right, I did what I had to do. Mm -hmm. And you have to balance everything between your business you know, your need to make money and you need to survive in this Absolutely. business. And also like longevity, it's like I know where, where the music is going. I think I know where the music is going. I mean, by default, all my life, you know, I survive because I kind of foresee where things are going. At least some of the scene are going, what's interesting, what's relevant. Mm -hmm. And I managed to like stay on top of that or at least find myself a niche within that, you know. I mean, it's between, you don't have to be following the trend you have to re I think we react to the trend when you have like you know an experience and you're in touch with your experience I think you react people like this entire like 90s house revival movement for me it's super boring <laughs> I mean I lived it like you know yeah. I made it you know I was really there you know mm -hmm. I was one of those guys so for me but I get it and I get that it's different and I get that people that listen to it and, and reinterpret it are doing it a fresh way, you know? And so I'm not against it, like I'm, but I'm doing my own take on it, you know? Yeah. And my own take is, well, maybe a bit more, like I said before, maybe a bit more eclectic, maybe more edgy, maybe more, I mean, off a bit, obscure, you know, it's normal, you yeah. know? If you ask me to, you know, to revive something, I'll, I'll add a twist to it, you know? Of course, yeah. Okay. With such a remarkable journey throughout your career, what would you say would be your most remarkable moment? I mean, there's many, many moments. I think there's moments in every different uh, time or period of my career. There is definitely, like, gr there were a lot of great moments, but for me, the greatest hasn't happened yet. There is, like, amazing moments. I mean, you know, 
I remember just like, you know, it's always this classic. If you ask anybody my, my generation in Montreal, they will tell you, well, Lamlight was amazing, which was where we met, and that was the time, and that was like, that was a world, it was a universe, and musically, and you know, the guy was playing music that wouldn't be out for one year, and like, you know, uh, he would play a mixture of, of things, a Montreal sound from those days, and I would tell you, super easy, it's like synth, percussion, energy you know and it stayed up today like it took forever you know you go Montreal you go in the mountain on Sunday you have thousands of people listening to bongo player I yeah. mean that's so yeah, Montreal yeah. so and synth uh, Montreal always had that kind of like you know Euro vibe too but at the same time you know there was the New York thing happening in Montreal so that period was amazing and just past that the entire new wave movement was like crazy like in all the scene in Montreal, all the clubs changed music style over six months. There was no more disco. Instant. Boom. Yeah. And then like, you know, and then we went from that to a bunch of other things, alternative music, the early age of how, I mean, definitely like the first few house tracks were um, amazing, you know, I mean, you know, being in New York at Paradise Garage is amazing, being not only at Paradise Garage, but being on all those clubs, meeting, being around all those great DJs and producer before they became great DJs and producer when they're just kids hanging out in New York yeah. were amazing. I mean, going to Chicago was amazing. Like, I'm lucky that I was like at a lot of places at a lot of times, you know, where like, you know, I witnessed all that evolution, you know, being in Europe in the 90s, you know, when house and acid house happened and when the entire ecstasy creation, like a movement happened and like all that, like, you know, I think, and, you know, the pre-rave scene in Montreal and see that happening, like, see, like, you know, being 500 people to be 5,000 people to see a scene that's like big, like 25 people going to a basement party to like, 2,500 six months later, like feel that, you know, yeah, and yeah. see like a bunch of kids like suddenly coming out of nowhere and seeing all those kids after that, like being like, you know, raver kids for like a couple of years, like going like super into like a house scene, you know, and like come like invading the clubs, invading, coming to record store, buying music and all that. I mean, uh, yeah. that, that was incredible, you know. Uh, I mean, up to today, like, you know, I think, like, just to see all the scene, you know, to see the after hour scene in Montreal from five, six years ago being non-existent to a certain generation, to your generation, to become relevant, see a place like Stereo having, like, nobody, you know, like, everybody being older and, like, kind of the old gay crowd to the transition of, like, all those new kids and all the new electronica, deep house, techno, call it whatever you want, all the sub-genres, yeah. seeing that happening, you're like, okay, there's hope, you know, yeah. like, you know, it's it's cool, but, like, it's, a uh, the world's going, it's going fast today. Very fast. And also, what's amazing, I think there's no more, there is trend, but, like, not, nothing gets lost. Before, there were trends. Okay, now we're into that, now it's that, now it's that. Now, there's a new trend, but like the thing that was flavor of the moment gets lost, but it gets reinvented right away. And there's a lot of roots to everything. So like if you're into doing stuff with one drum machine, one keyboard and really lo-fi kind of like early house, it's very trendy now, or it's been trendy for a couple of years, but it will still be trendy in five years from now because it will kind of get reinvented and then somebody else will take it and bring it to another level. It's really exciting what's going on now. Always was interested in too, like what new people are doing, and always super interested. In also, also, I'm super respectful to to a lot of people that you know influenced me through my life. You know, like older DJs. I mean, there's not many left older DJs, you know, but the ones are still there. Uh, I always have huge respect for them, and for me, like you know, I always like to connect people. You know, I've done it at. Uh, uh, Last year, I've done it at Picnic. I brought Robert We Met, which was one of my main influences, a guy in, in his 60s, you know, and I brought Pat Boogie, which is a guy that's uh, mm -hmm. like the generation after me. And I could have brought, you know, someone like you, that's the generation after, you know, could have, like we've done the three generation thing and it was super interesting, you know, and I want to like, you know, I want to do that to inspire the guy like Pat, that's like, you know, in his mid career, you know, and a guy like, you know, Robert that, that's done his career is like, you know, he's done his career, still active, you know, but in, the, in different ways. And someone like me to bring people like that. I always like to bring people really together. Cool. I think it's part of the entire Lost Heroes is that, right? Yeah. It's kind of 
that's the idea, you know, the idea of like to bring back like that like amazing feeling that you have that like when you're in a club and you get lost in music, you know. For me, ultimately, is that the on, the ultimate thing for me is to go somewhere where the music is amazing and it, and I don't and I don't know anything playing. I mean, that's just super exciting. And through the age, I had that. I had the chance to, to, and I still like you know. I mean, it doesn't happen that often, but from time to time, I'll be I'll go to hear a DJ. Either he plays a style that I don't know, or someone that plays something that I know, but is playing super far in music, and I'll be like. Wow, like, okay, yeah. that gives you, like, it looks mm -hmm. forward. You know, like, we used to be like, okay, I need that song and wait for a song and need to have that song. Today, there's less and less of that. You know, a lot of stuff, you can get it. You know, you get a rip, you get this, you get that. The magic of waiting for the music, waiting for yeah. two, three, four months for the music to come out. Okay, the guy has a white label or has a dub plate or anything like that. I mean, all that is kind of... No, yes and no. I mean, there's few people, there's few group of people that still maintain that, and I think that's super important. Uh, guys like Dixon and the entire Inner Vision crew, I mean, they have a bunch of music that they just, you won't get for a long time, you know, like, they have it among themselves, you know, and they yeah. will play. And I think that's super important, because that makes you want to go, yeah, and like, that's going to be something special, you know, let's go listen to Arno Dix or Henrik, you know, they're gonna have like, okay, like, you know, what is that that the, I mean, I, you know, I'm asking Henrik like for you know, about stuff that he, that he, that I heard him playing like two years ago and he's like, oh, it's not ready. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> like stuff that is amazing for yeah, me, yeah. like, you know, I mean, I, I have weird taste, like with the time, like it's like anything else, like if you're into Uh, wine, you know, I mean at some point you'll be into funky wine, you know, like, you know, you can appreciate classic wine But yeah. you'll be into like bio-organic, so music-wise is the same thing for me, like I'm into I'm into not weirder stuff or more eclectic stuff, more particular stuff, you know I mean there is, I can, I don't really care about generic stuff, I mean It's useful. Sometimes it's just a vehicle to bring people from point A to point B. But I find there's way too too much good music to waste your time playing something that's like, meh. Like everything yes. I play, I would say 99% of things that I play is really stuff that I really like. You know, yeah. I love. You yeah. know, ha have to be like. There's no time. Yeah. There's, you know, I don't have enough years in front of me to waste my time playing stuff that's just generic, right? Yeah. Just so people can. Yeah. yeah. I <laughs> rather I rather in tear dance floor and get a reaction. Then, then just so that's something that doesn't exist anymore. Nobody cleans the floor anymore. I mean, mm -hmm. it used to be like that. It used to be like if you don't play the right track, you will empty your floor. <laughs> Do you know any DJs that empty floors now? No, people are there, but people are less engaged. Yeah. So you have the advantage of people. You don't clear your floor, but people are less engaged. Yeah. People are on their phone, yeah. like all that. But we're really like we're still at the early stage of that. That all the technology being available, the this, the that, the club, the music being available. That's the hardest thing is that, because if you want to hear your favorite DJ, you don't need to go in the club. Yeah. I mean, unless, you, that's why I think like, you know, the experience of the club has to be renewed. I think people have to rethink about it, because like, the mystique of it doesn't really exist. It's really hard to maintain that mystique. You, know, you really have to be control, in control of all the elements. And I think there's less and less of that, you know, there's less and less the music people or the artist people taking care of uh, the entire ambiance of the place, you know. And I think art is always uh, also being vacuumed out of the, of the club business. Before, like, I guess music was important. It's funny, music was more, had more influence, but there was less system, there was less the DJ. Nobody looked at the DJ. People were coming for the music, but they didn't look at the DJ. DJ was there. They were dancing among themselves. They didn't have a good time. But you control the crowd. Yeah. Nowadays, people look at you, but I don't know how much influence you have, you know. So what is your favorite and least favorite aspects of Montreal? <sighs> I mean, Montreal today is very different than it was. Uh, to say that Montreal is a small city uh, or a smaller city uh, is not quite accurate anymore because it doesn't, you know, on one sense it doesn't really matter where you live because you can live 
two hours outside of Montreal, you can be connected with the world. I mean, a lot of my friends, I mean, I communicate with people from everywhere around the world every day, and you don't really, it doesn't really phase you, right? Like I have friends in London, you have friends in you know, San Francisco, you have friends here, you have friends in, in Asia, you know. It, not that it doesn't matter, but like, you know, you're way more connected. So, I mean, that doesn't matter really, and there's a lot of stuff happening in Montreal. It's quite incredible, like the amount of, events like in art and music and entertainment that's happening in Montreal for the side of the city is quite amazing uh, it still is a small city I mean the weather is still the weather this four season is the beauty of it but at the same time it's a drag for me it's getting a drag a bit uh, uh, I you know Montreal is like it's a cool city it's I don't think it could be uh, there's not many places in the world that could live the life I live with and have what I have like I could I don't think I could have a studio that space in New York or even in Toronto or in London I could maybe have it in Spain or maybe have it but everywhere else it's 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 for to be that central to have that kind of cultural aspect of it and for the price even if it's higher and it's still money you know because I mean the opportunities are not the same like it's a tricky thing because like the only problem with Montreal is like once you get to the top, there's no staying at the top. Where in other cities you get to the top or you get like, you know, recognized in a certain field and then you are constantly going to work and you are constantly, you don't need to put so much effort. You can just roll because like, you know, you establish yourself. Montreal, you never establish. Uh, as much as you work, you're like you're just as good as your last gig and it applies, especially in Montreal. Uh, you can be amazing at what you're doing, doesn't mean the phone's gonna ring. Doesn't mean that people will recognize your work. Uh, it's a city that's really caught in the hype. I think it's more caught in the hype than many other cities. Uh, it's a city that doesn't want to be, it's really afraid to, uh, to be, uh, to be dated or to be out of the game. They always, it's always a city that's been looking for the next big thing. So it doesn't necessarily curate things based on quality or personal taste. You know, people, there's people that love what I do, but like they cannot work with me because they don't really know, they cannot assume it. You know, where in a bigger city, you can just say, hey, this is what I like, this is what I do, period. Yeah. I don't really mm -hmm. give a shit about what other people think. This is what I'm gonna do, and it works. You know, people are closer to, you know, I mean, I think it's important that people that are in the business, either it's in the club business or the music business. I think it's more important to do stuff. If you really do stuff you believe in, I think if you believe in it, I mean, other people will, you know. I mean, that's the that's the only thing about Montreal. It suffer that syndrome of not, there's not enough people to, to, uh, to sustain everything and there's a lot of DJs in Montreal you know and there's a lot of clubs and there's a lot of people that are ready to play and there's a lot of young people and there's a lot of older people and there's like you know there's people from my generation I mean there's not many people left from my generation but there's a reason for that a lot of my friend you know older friend in Europe they still play a lot you know there's and there's no question there's no uh, in a city like Montreal it's really hard to like you know make a living you know like yeah. just doing either DJing or producer or this and that it's you got to be out there unfortunately even if you're super connected you have to be you have to be in Berlin you have to go to London you have to go to wherever the cities that like things are happening for you or for your scene or what do you want to do I mean uh, but at the same time you know summertime Montreal is amazing you know I mean you can get by Montreal making not so much money and you don't really have to worry about it you don't have to hustle I mean that's double-edged sore you know because you don't have to hustle so you don't really you know it's like going to the gym you know if you could just push something you're comfortable you're not gonna never gonna get big right you're just gonna well, you gotta be fit so like Montreal you can be like just get by you're okay you know you don't yeah, push that yeah. much you know you don't need to push that much because hey it's okay I have a system uh, I can find a cheap apartment uh, I can get by uh, I go out doesn't really cost like you know you go in other cities it's like hey you know like you, know, you gotta pay to go there you have to pay to do this your rent costs you money to go around it costs you money you know I live in London for a while and it was like wow like you know I mean I was in my late 30s when I live in London 
and it felt like I was like 18 years old. Right. Like, yeah, yeah, like I had to live with people in an apartment and everybody that I knew, like families live together, young couple, two couple live together. Like a lot of people, it's very expensive, you know, yeah. like in a place and just lifestyle, you know, you can live in the best cities in the world if you want. If you don't have the money to afford everything that is happening in that city, I mean, it might as well live it's in Montreal. Yeah. So that's why I think Montreal is a good base. Uh, it's not brilliant if you want to be international DJ because, like you know, you should be based in, uh, you know, Berlin, uh, France, uh, or Spain. Actually, uh, Berlin or in Spain, you know, it's the cheapest place you can live in Europe, you know, uh, and get by easy. You know, probably like you know, if if uh, if there would be anything else, it would be that. It would have to be that if you really want to pursue. If you only live off. Uh, as a DJ, and that's your main income. I mean, you cannot. I, I doubt that you can be in Montreal and do yeah, that. Yeah. You know, that's unfortunately. You know, because the gigs, there's no not so much money, and the people that take decision and promoters are not really people that are uh, so educated uh, in terms of music, and they don't really have a lot of vision. So, except a few examples, this and the example you chose. You know, the people that are doing their job properly. You know. They have a successful night, they have a successful club, and it's still open after all those years, etc., etc. You know, I mean, I mean, that's that's the only that's the only downside of Montreal I find. You know, apart from the weather, yeah, terrible. <laughs> you know? Of you know. course, seems as you're an all-around artist. Uh, you're very involved in the fashion industry as well. Can you tell us a bit more about your involvement in the? Uh, I've been like since the past about uh, 10, 15 years. I've been like you know doing, being very involved in the, in the fashion industry as a music consultant for fashion shows, and uh, and became after that I became uh, you know more uh, involved creatively in terms of like you know uh, working within the fashion show itself and like creating universe for the fashion show, but over like you know just the music, the light, the video what's going on, the entire ambiance, you know, I think fashion show is a, doing a fashion show is like doing a soundtrack, it's the same thing, but you're cheating, because you actually don't license anything, and you, you don't really have to produce music, so I'm, I'm borrowing a lot from my DJ experience into creating a mood, and I'm using some of my production skill, so I take some part of music, and I will do extra production over it and create a little soundtrack, a little story. And it's great because during a fashion show, most of the time you're in control of the environment. So it's a little 15 minutes where you're in control of the light, the video, the sound. People are there, they're watching. Like you're really in control. It's a small thing. It's in and out. And it's like, it's like kind of a club gig. It's like happened once. It's gone after. So what can we expect for you? within the next few years? Uh, we're working like, uh, we've been working for a while. I mean, I closed in Beat five years ago now. Uh, it took me, uh, took me a while to like, you know, uh, stabilize my professional life. It was al already pretty stabilized, i tell you the truth, but it was just, it was a big, uh, it was a big thing, closing a business that I had for 21 years, like, you know, the changing of like all that scene. Uh, I was okay with it. But it, it took a couple of years just to like, you know, to, to, you know, build a new system, you know, of how you're making money and yeah. all this and now, and I was really involved with fashion, but like, you know, you have to foresee, like, you know, I knew that, you know, fashion, you know, it's not forever. Like I still do a lot of them, but now you want to do something else, you know, you don't want to put your eggs in all the same basket. So, and at the same time, I have more time to do other stuff. So. I've been playing way more since the past five years, funny enough. When I had the record store, I was almost not playing. Now I'm playing a lot, locally, but I really enjoy playing. I really enjoy playing. I, I love it. Like, <laughs> playing is like, not that it's easy, but it's always a challenge. Look, after 30 years, it's like, it's like playing a sport or something like that, you know, like, you can, not you can always get better, but I believe, like, you know, you can always, I mean, I'm always trying to get better at it, you know, get, I mean, not technically, but the storytelling, the, where you bring the crowd, how you wrap the night, you know, can you make, you know, sometimes you finish a set and you're like, okay, this was, people, not it was amazing because, oh my God, I'm so good, or I played so well. No, it was amazing because what I wanted to share with people, they understood and they went with me and you really feel that. That is it's the most, yeah, that's the most amazing thing. And now, like, you know, we developed a, 
uh, a lot of outlet for, like I said, my creative direction, like all that other side of the business that I do a lot, and music production, obviously, you know, because a lot of people, like, you know, uh, expect stuff, and you expect to have uh, stuff. I have very uh, few release out, you know, under the name of Lost Heroes. I'm lucky enough to work with the people of Inner Vision, you know, and uh, I work with, like, other great projects, you know, that I had a lot of fun with, and I did, you know, quite... Uh, you know, a lot of mileage with very few records, you know, and I'm sitting on zillions of records, you know, zillions of unfinished projects, you know, but it's part of, I think, the concept of Lost Heroes, you know, at some yeah. point, like, <laughs> we'll open the gate of it. So there's a lot of things in the pipeline uh, uh, coming out as just released. There's a lot of things, a lot of different style. Uh, I'm actually just in inventory of edits, you know, there's over like 200 edits that I've done that likely will flow freely online eventually or like you know because i'm sitting on it there's nothing to do a lot of people that needed to play it they play it not that i'm not attached to it but edit is an edit is an edit is an edit you know there's a couple other projects there's a compilation project that i'm working that's going to be really interesting that's going to be really capturing a lot of uh, the music that was uh, a lot of music a lot of back catalog stuff but a lot of stuff that makes sense today there's a lot of music that I'm gonna, you know, work and put out that stuff that's sounds super fresh today, but like was made like 30 years ago, you know, stuff that I that's think cool. is like makes sense today, like yeah. totally like, and you know, kind of disco, neo disco, like electronica, Italian, but alternative. There's a lot of music that falls between the crack, you know, and for me, it's all all one thing like techno or that it's it's question of energy mm -hmm. sound sonic energy i'm really more i've always been into sonic aspect of music i think you know people i'm into the kind of soul aspect of the music and the music music itself like the musicality of it but overall i've always been into like the sound you know i think what attracted me in, in disco days you know was the sound you know i mean the feel of the studio like it took me a while to understand that, all that stuff how it was made you know and i i took a, i took an engine a, a sound design or sound engineering uh, course you know i don't know when i was 17 you know like and like you know and i was like wow okay that's how you do it. you overdub the delay the this the that and since that day like i'm always fascinated even i listen to record that were made like 25 30 years ago four years ago and i'm like how did they make that? You know, like how, you know, listen to old Giorgio Mortar, but, you know, craft work, like, and a lot more obscure stuff. And you're like, how did they do that? Yeah. Like, you know, even today, like, you know, I'm amazed. Yeah, I still study all those records. For me, those records were amazing. I'm really attracted by the entire analog aspect of things, but also, like, today technology in today's world, everything's possible. So, you know, a lot of, definitely, like, the, the goal, the focus is really, like, you know, uh, on the last heroes as as an art uh, as an artistic entity and it's definitely where we're going you know the re-edit uh, compilation project all, also under last heroes and under my name well I have like a bunch of uh, I'm a music consultant full time that's how I make a living so I work in fashion I work in advertising I work in uh, as creative director for special events I, I work in uh, uh, also it's kind of marketing you know it's like the experience, you know, yeah. I'm a guy of experience, you know, mm -hmm. you bring me a project about an experience, either it's a club, it's a, it's the opening of things, it's a concept, it's a it's a campaign, advertising campaign, I'm about the concept, I'm a man of concept, yeah. you know, 